Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming here. My name is uh, Tony Blankley. I'm honored to be the guest moderator uh, at this panel discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm, uh, I'm particularly delighted to get into this topic about uh, crime, about the abuse of the criminal process by prosecutors, by the system that's evolved over the last 30, 40, 50 years. I was a prosecutor myself in, in Los Angeles for eight years in, in the 1970s. And even then, which was by comparison a more innocent time, uh, I was shocked at the power that we had and the ease of abusing it and the system that was slowly getting out of control so that even if you had good faith, even if you intended to be an honorable prosecutor, the very process by which you exercise discretion, the increasing ambiguity of the law. Uh, it was harder and harder to, to, for people to know what they were supposed to do as a crime. Uh, that used to be the proposition that if you didn't know it was a crime, you know, I, I'll be a little florid in my language just for a couple of seconds. The criminal law used to be a, a series of oak trees that reached up into the sky and you would see them and behold them and contemplate on it. And they were usually descriptions of the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't rape, don't steal, don't give false witnesses. Now the law is like the blades of grass in a meadow. You can't see them, you, you, you don't identify with them, and yet they have poisonous tips, and, and if you just innocently walk along the field, you can end up in a, you know, poisoned, legally poisoned, put in a cage, and you, you never knew that there was a, a crime. How can, how can you be guilty of something if you never knew there was a crime? And yet, increasingly, as we've criminalized uh, what is really non-criminal activity, whether it's regulation, whether it's administration, uh, and then you know, we've created an impossibility, a sort of a moral impossibility to know whether you've, uh, you're, you're supposed to be doing something, whether it's right or wrong. And we've got two authors today who have just written wonderful books. And um, on this topic, we're going to spend uh, about 45 minutes with the speakers talking and then have plenty of time uh, to do some, some uh, comments and questions from, from you folks. Uh, let me... Uh, I'm supposed to tell you not to, uh, to turn off your, your cell phones, please, uh, although um, I'm, I'm, you know, one, of the, one of the problems is the advance of technology creates all sorts of new opportunities for oppressive and ambiguous crimes. And uh, I was thinking of the cell phone, which as we speak is being turned into a crime to use in various forms. Uh, so it's interesting how each new piece of technology uh, creates a creative opportunity for well-intended people to uh, uh, encroach on, on our freedoms. And, and uh, safety, which is the argument that, I, that terrifies me, I think, the most amongst the, the people who want new, new criminal laws. I'm always reminded of the fact that Robespierre uh, position of power when he managed the reign of terror uh, was as the, uh, the commissioner of uh, the commission uh, for public safety uh, and safety justified executing people uh, just based on the discretion of, of uh, the commissioners so uh, the 12 commissioners who are for public safety and so when we hear safety is a justification to encroach uh, on our rights we should see it for, for the seditious effect it has on our freedoms I think. Let me uh, let me now introduce our first speaker, who has just come back from testifying in Congress. Uh, and I read his book uh, last night, and, and it is a tremendous book, Harvey Silverglate. Uh, he's been practicing law for more than 40 years, specializes in criminal defense, civil liberties, and academic freedom. He handles cases both in the state and the federal courts. Uh, his focus is on the in particular abuse of, of, of the federal law and federal prosecutors. And while I never practiced that where, in that area, I know a, quite a number of federal prosecutors in town. I followed it, and, and there's tremendous importance to, to, to this point. And so he's combined his legal experience and a career as a professor in, in, in civil liberties and a, and a writer for the Boston Phoenix and, and other places. He's, it's a tremendous work and uh, well worth both listening to the professor now and, and reading this book. I, I sit up last night and, and read it, and uh, I think it's a tremendous book. So, uh, Mr. Silverglade, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want me to do that? Okay. I 
I was told I can go to the podium so you can get a better shot at me. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the generous introduction. Uh, and I should say some of my best friends are prosecutors, too. Uh, or at least were until the book came out. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I had an experience yesterday that was actually quite moving. Uh, when I went to testify before the House Subcommittee on Crime, I was getting out of my taxi in front of the Rayburn office building, and the taxi right in back of mine, somebody jumps out, and it was a prosecutor from the Department of Justice who had spent some time in Boston prosecuting an absolutely absurd case. I thought it was an absurd case of my client. And um, the prosecutor got out of the taxi, uh, came over to me, said, you know, I, I read your book, and uh, you were very fair uh, in how you described the case. So that was the, the best compliment I've gotten about the book so far, that one of the prosecutors in the book who lost the case, I'm happy to say, so is my client, uh, told me that he thought that I was fair uh, to the department in that case. I'm sure that won't be true with all the uh, cases, but it was a, it was a good start. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm particularly pleased to be here at Cato because it was 11 years ago that I was here with Alan Charles Kors where we launched the Shadow University, the betrayal of liberty on America's campuses. And the uh, Shadow University, which is still in print, I'm happy to say, turned out to be uh, a kind of a, a, a small classic. Uh, it resulted in the launch of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, uh, which uh, specializes in protecting free speech and academic freedom and due process on uh, college campuses. Now, it's not a coincidence that um, my outline for the Shadow University uh, and my outline for what turns out to be three felonies a day were done at about the same time, the mid-1980s. And the reason I started to uh, focus on these two problems, the campus speech codes and the harassment codes, and also the, 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 at, the point, at that point nascent, the beginning of the uh, federal uh, practice of prosecuting people under statutes that nobody could uh, fairly understand uh, and for committing crimes that even a sophisticated lawyer would look at the conduct, look at the statute, look at the indictment and wonder what it was that the defendant did that was criminal. That's a very bad sign for a criminal justice system when experienced lawyers can't tell you why it's a crime that you know, somebody's been indicted for conduct, you can't figure out why. So, um, <clears throat> But it's no coincidence, because vagueness is really the enemy of liberty. It allows deans, prosecutors, it allows them to do whatever they want to whomever they want. Um, and as long as there's nothing to stop them, then this is just the steamroller. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the... Um, the speech codes on the campus and the statutes that I'm talking about uh, are um, uh, really uh, uh, the quintessential elements of this vagueness due process problem. Vagueness is a due process problem. If you are prosecuted for doing something where you had no reasonable notice it was a crime, that is a violation of a due process. Um, and I'm going to just read you a couple of sentences. This is from... Uh, taking us back 11 years. This is from uh, the Shadow University, and it's about some of the excerpts from some of the speech codes on campuses. And uh, I'll just read you four sentences here. Sometimes the policies say it all. In New England, quote, harassment, close quote, <clears throat> has included within recent times jokes and ways of telling stories, quote, experienced by others as harassing. That's Bowdoin College quote, verbal behavior that produces feelings of impotence, anger, and disenfranchisement, whether intentional or unintentional, Brown University. <clears throat> Speech that causes loss of self-esteem or a vague sense of danger, Colby College, or even, quote, inappropriately directed laughter, inconsiderate jokes, and stereotyping, University of Connecticut. 
anyway, I don't have to, I think, read any more for you to get the picture. You can be thrown out of college, and students are indeed thrown out of college all the time for that kind of behavior based on those kinds of codes. Of course, what it means is the dean can get rid of anybody that the dean wants to get rid of because we all, don't we tell, in a, inappropriately directed humor and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so that problem came up in the mid-1980s, and uh, as I said, on the uh, federal uh, criminal side, I noticed the, the same vagueness, the, the same you know, ease with which somebody who for some reason came within a prosecutor's sights uh, could be uh, indicted and convicted uh, and sentenced, and that's because judges tend uh, far more than they should to kind of go along with this. Oh, we all understand what this means, don't we? Well, you know, no, Your Honor, uh, some of us don't. We actually uh, pay attention to the English language, and we don't understand this gibberish. Um, so uh, by 1990, I had the book outlined. It took me all this time to get around to, to writing it, because um, <clears throat> I've been practicing law while I've been trying to write, and that's, that, that's a bit of a burden. Um, we don't get, we lawyers don't get sabbaticals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I have to say, I had a tremendous amount of encouragement to finish this book, because it was quite a chore. It took me almost five years by uh, Tim Lynch uh, and by David Bowes here at, at Cato. Um, they thought that it was an essential uh, undertaking, and every time I started to lag a little, uh, they, would, they would give me a little boost. Um, they're terrific pests, I have to say, really uh, practiced. Um, and um, let me explain for a moment the title, Three Felonies a Day. The, it's uh, slightly sarcastic, maybe slightly humorous, uh, but the notion is this. An average busy professional in this country gets up in the morning, you know, gets the kids off to school, goes to work, uses the telephone, there we go, federal offense, uses the telephone or email, uh, has meetings, or works on a prospectus or a bank loan or whatever, uh, goes home, uh, puts the kids to bed as dinner, uh, reads the newspaper, uh, and uh, goes to sleep and has no idea that in the course of that day, uh, he or she has very likely committed three felonies, uh, three felonies that some ambitious uh, creative prosecutor uh, can pick out of that day, day's activities uh, and put into an indictment if the feds so, so want. And um, that's, as I said, a slight exaggeration, but really not much. Uh, the, um, I want to also point out the phenomenon that I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about federalism. Do I personally believe the federal government has usurped areas that should remain uh, with the states? I do, and I also think we're much better off leaving them to the states because the states actually do a better job in a lot of these kinds of criminal areas. But I'm not talking about federalism. I'm also not talking about another problem over criminalization, which I know that Cato is very active in dealing with right now. There are so many crimes on the books, uh, the explosion of uh, criminal statutes. I think that's a huge problem, but when you at least can understand them, then you at least have a leg up because if you, you know, you can navigate a day if you understand what the law says. You can presumably navigate a day without becoming a criminal. But when the statutes are vague, you're helpless. You're totally at the mercy of the government because nobody can figure out. Even if you wanted to be a slave, you couldn't figure out how to be a slave because you didn't, you don't know what you should refrain from doing. So uh, it, this is a, a, a problem separate from, although somewhat related to, um, the others. Now, um, <clears throat> Alan Dershowitz wrote a, um, wrote a forward to the book, and uh, <clears throat> He was completely free, of course, to write what he wanted. Some of his theories of how to solve this problem I actually don't agree with. 
um, uh, and some I do, but he has a very interesting uh, paragraph uh, about he, Dershowitz litigated some cases in the old Soviet Union, and um, uh, he was always taken by the fact that they could prosecute anybody they want because, you know, some of the statutes were so vague, you know, they outlawed hooliganism, see. And, of course, who was a hooligan? I guess depended on whether the government the, in power liked you or didn't like you, and that's how they determined if you were a hooligan. And uh, he points out in the forward that it, this was a technique developed by Beria, who was the infamous sidekick to Stalin, who said, quote, show me the man and I'll find you the crime, close quote. And that really is... Um, something that uh, has survived the Soviet Union, has in fact crossed continents, and has arrived here in the good old USA. Show me the man, uh, says any federal prosecutor, and I can show you the crime. We are, it's not an exaggeration, uh, ask anybody who's been indicted, ask anybody who's tried one of these crazy cases, it is not an exaggeration. It may not have hit everybody in this room yet, but it certainly can and certainly will hit a few. Um, now, how does this play out in, in the United States? Why is it that the department does this, the Department of Justice? Well, to some extent, uh, this weapon is aimed at unpopular citizens and members of unpopular or suspicious groups. It isn't, I think, the primary impetus, but it certainly is a tool, for example, for going after these days Muslims, uh, political uh, people in a political party out of power. Um, you know, anybody who happens to be a target for any reason, uh, they, they, they go after. Uh, but it's hardly limited to just unpopular groups. Um, for the most part, uh, I think these uh, prosecutions are random. Uh, they sometimes have a lot to do with uh, ambitions of prosecutors and wanting to get their name in the papers. Uh, but, but, and sometimes there are prosecutors with psychological disabilities that sort of, you know, they, 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 they think that it's their job to clean up the world, to clean up the country from dishonest people. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, fundamentally, I don't really understand uh, all of the motives that go into the use of these weapons. I only can tell you, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I can just tell you that these weapons are sprung with alarming frequency and increasing frequency. Um, and, you know, you can assess the motives of the people who, who spring them. Um, uh, let me make a prediction. Uh, my prediction is that we are going to be seeing in the next couple of years uh, a, a tidal wave of prosecutions growing out of the financial crisis. Now, different people from different perspectives have different explanations for why we had a crash. Um, but the Department of Justice is going to have figured it out. Of it, fraudulent individuals have caused all this. It's got nothing to do with government regulation. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with culture. It's got to do with uh, individuals who have committed crimes that have caused all of our woes. Um, now, let me give you an example of what I think is coming. Um, during the uh, height of the crash, as the bricks were tumbling down all around us, you had uh, bank officers, bank presidents, brokerage house uh, presidents, you had them in, uh, talking to the press uh, around the clock virtually uh, because the press was inquiring, oh, is your bank about to go? Is your, are you illiquid? Do you have, you know, tarnished assets, blah, blah, blah? And these bank officers, these bank presidents, were saying, well, no, as far as I can see right now, you know, we're liquid, we're going to make it through this, um, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, my prediction, uh, and I'm happy to come back in a year, and you can either call me a, a prophet or you can call me an idiot, 
My prediction is there are going to be a lot of these prosecutions by bank officials, of bank officials, because they had the temerity to predict that their bank was going to make it okay, and the bank didn't make it through okay. Um, and, of course, uh, think about it. Think about a bank president being asked, is your bank liquid? Can your depositors actually, if they wanted to withdraw their money tomorrow, would they get it? And what's he supposed to say? If he says no, there's an immediate rush on the bank. The bank, it's over in 10 minutes. So no officer of a bank can possibly get up there and say, we're, we're gone, because then they are gone. And of course, if he can maintain confidence, then the bank will make it through. And yet, watch these prosecutions. They're, they're coming. Um, now, um, <clears throat> how do I know this? Because it's already happened. Now, listen to this story. You know, everybody knows about Martha Stewart, right? Um, she was indicted, not for insider trading, because what she did probably is not insider trading. Nobody can say for sure because the insider trading laws are so vague that nobody can define them. And they're, by the way, intentionally uh, kept vague. Um, now, Martha Stewart had one count uh, in her indictment uh, that, um, uh, that charged that what, when she was uh, under investigation for insider trading or whatever they they, they later, of course, got her to talk to the feds, and they indicted her for false statement in talking to the feds. There's a lesson in that. Don't ever talk to the feds. Um, she was charged for having a press conference and releasing a statement saying that she was not guilty of insider trading. And so in addition to indicting her for false statement to the feds, they indicted her for falsely denying her guilt at a press conference of Martha Stewart living on the media. In other words, her crime was her failure, her failure to make an abject plea of guilty on national television in front of the entire press when asked about whether she had committed insider trading fraud. Um, that's what tells me that these press conferences by these bank officials uh, who were denying that they were uh, the, on the edge of collapse, they're going to get indicted for denying that they're on the edge of collapse, even though had they said otherwise, they would have collapsed. So it's really a kind of, uh, we're living in a world now which is a mixture of Orwell and Kafka, a uh, little, little bit of each. Um, now, People have said, I didn't spend enough time in this book on solutions. I've got six or seven pages uh, on where I think we should be going, sort of general prescriptions of where we should be going. It's true that I don't have a lot of surefire solutions. That's not what the book was about. Uh, besides, I'm not that smart. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a, an academic. And so uh, I really don't know the solution. But I did want to point out the problem because I don't believe that our best minds are going to be able to, uh, uh, to be put to the task of solving this problem if we don't realize that it's a huge problem and that we're all uh, so uh, vulnerable. But I do have, to the very end of the book, I do have a few tentative suggestions um, uh, for the directions in which we can be going. Um, in any event, um, I do think that whatever the solution to this problem is, it's going to arise from an energized response for those, by those people who love liberty and value liberty. Uh, they're going to come up with the solutions, whatever those solutions are. And uh, Cato, of course, is part of that group, which is why I'm so pleased uh, to be here uh, Today, I think this, uh, co the coalitions that Cato is building and participating in, which are bar bipartisan, uh, left and right and center, uh, in the criminal justice arena is very useful, uh, and I think leads, leads the way. So I think that we all have to work together on this, and uh, perhaps we can uh, beat back the Leviathan. And thank you very much. Thank you. That was excellent. A uh, couple of quick thoughts, and then we'll 
get on to our, our next speaker, who I know many of you are familiar with. Uh, I think one of the points that we, a lot of you, I want to keep in mind as this issue develops beyond the, this, this forum is the importance that the public, and particularly media, have that this isn't a liberal or conservative point of view. You can be a conservative prosecutor and be it equally appalled with the abuse that, that this has. You can be a liberal and be appalled with the speech codes. Uh, th that, that it's important that this not be pigeonholed, different parts of these concerns as either the conservative or the liberal, because then that tells all the people out in the country who are liberal or conservative, oh, this isn't my fight because I'm a conservative and this is a liberal argument, or the other way around. So I think it's a very important uh, point to keep in mind as we do this. Um, one example of, of, of what the professor was talking about is uh, that I've experienced, so many people in Washington have and will experience, is when you leave government and you have the ethics rules and what you're allowed and not allowed to do, it is an impossibility almost to find out whether you are committing a felony because you, you are you allowed to bump into your assistant three months later and say, hi, happy birthday, or, or has that been a, an unintended contact with a prohibited office? And, and, and this town is filled with people who don't intend to abuse the ethics. We, we all go to lawyers to say, what are we allowed to do and not do? Not because we want to figure out the edge of where, how much we can do to can get away with. We want to avoid even the beginning of it. I, I'm not a lobbyist. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not in that business, but I still have to be careful when I left various government services to, to go out into the, in, in the private sector. And particularly in a town like this, you talk about the, the Soviet abuse, and of course we're not there, and God willing we'll never be there. But in this town of Republicans and Democrats, how dangerous is it to have vague and un incomprehensible laws that one group of people, Republican appointees, and then another group of people, Democratic appointees, are constantly in jeopardy of being accused of. I mean, malicious prosecution would be very easy under those circumstances. Just one example for Washingtonians to understand the, the nature of, of the emerging danger. Well, um, our second speaker, Tim Lynch, uh, as, as you know, uh, director of Cato's uh, Project on Criminal Justice, and uh, he's been with Cato for, gosh, almost, what, 20, 1991. So a long time. He's a prolific author. Uh, he's on all the different uh, shows, O'Reilly, NewsHour, C-SPAN, um, and he's put together a book that he edited, and, and uh, I read this the night before last, and... Uh, and it, it's also a, a, a wonderful book. I, in, he had a quote here. I just set it up because it, it rang so true. He quotes in his introduction from James Madison. And he says, it will be a, this is James Madison speaking, it will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood if they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated, or undergo such incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. I mean, that reads like the recent history of Congress. Uh, you know, the language that is, is, is incomprehensible, constant changing back and forth. And injustice. Here's the man who, who wrote the Constitution describing our condition today as an intolerable one. I mean, I think that is a, a revealing sense of how far we have moved. Uh, and in fairly recent times, certainly in the last 70 years, dramatically in, I'd say, the last 20 to 40 years, which is a very quick time. Most of us of a, of a certain age can remember when things were much better for individual freedom, and particularly regarding criminalizing what ought to be free human conduct. So with that, I'll turn the page over to Mr. Lynch. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, I wish I could begin my talk by, <clears throat> didn't have to begin with some bad news, but um, it is my unhappy responsibility to inform you that things are even worse than Harvey Silverglade uh, says. Um, but let me back up and ask a basic question, and that is, what do we want from our criminal justice system? 
it seems to me that we should want several things from it. But boiled down, I think we want the government to have enough power so it can identify and remove criminals from peaceful civil society, but not give the government so much power that it becomes oppressive on the rest of us. But unfortunately, that seems to be what is happening today. The power that is wielded by police and prosecutors is just immense. We have to remember that all it takes is one raid on a home or a business, one high-profile arrest, or an indictment that's uh, announced on the steps of a, a courthouse, and a person's life can be changed uh, forever. Reputation gone, jobs gone, friends gone. And that's even before you get the opportunity to defend yourself in a court of law. And once you find out what it's going to cost you to defend yourself in court these days, you'll find out that you're facing financial ruin. The costs, as uh, Harvey will tell you, of having to go into federal court to defend yourself, you're looking at your retirement savings gone, your college funds that you set aside for your children will be gone, and most likely your, your house will be gone. If you combine the situation that Harvey Silverglade described, where police and prosecutors can basically have just about anybody charged with an offense, and you combine that with a system in which our constitutional rights have been watered down, you'll begin to see how dangerously powerful the government has become and how vulnerable all of us are to agencies like the IRS and all of the other alphabet agencies in the federal government, as well as the local law enforcement bureaucracies. <coughs> As has been mentioned, there was a time where you could live your life and order your affairs in such a way where you could drastically reduce your exposure to a arrest and an indictment. But those days are gone. And as Tony said, um, I think this is an issue that should concern people from all points along the political spectrum, whether you come from the left or the right. Now, my book, In the Name of Justice, is an edited volume, as Tony said. And after reviewing the literature in the criminal law field, I came to the conclusion that a book like this was needed because law professors tend to put too much of their time and energy into writing and publishing articles on obscure topics or very technical topics. So you'll find law review articles on a question of the police power to search. They'll say, like, if you had the police have probable cause to <coughs> search a vehicle, do they then have probable cause also to then search a container inside that vehicle? Can they open up a backpack? that's inside the uh, vehicle. Or you'll find articles about the permissible and impermissible questions that prosecutors can ask uh, potential jurors before a trial gets underway. Now, these are important questions, and I know we have to rely on law professors to use their expertise to address technical issues, but my point is not enough attention is being focused on the fundamental questions, such as what kinds of conduct should be a crime in the first place. So to bring more attention to that question, I found what I thought was the best article in the field. It was written in 1958 by Professor Henry Hart of the Harvard Law School. I then asked some of this country's leading scholars, judges, and practitioners to take a look at uh, Professor Hart's article, which we republished in the book, to take another look at it, to look at his arguments about what should be a crime and what shouldn't be a crime, and then to offer their thoughts as to how well his arguments have held up over the last 50 years. And I was pleased that Harvey Silverglate could uh, bring his wealth of experience uh, to the book with his own essay. But instead of trying to summarize all the essays uh, that are in this volume, what I'm going to do is focus on my own thesis in the introductory essay to the book. And my thesis is that we are drifting away from the basic constitutional and legal principles that have made the American criminal justice system the best one in the world. In the book, I discuss about 20 legal principles and show how they've been badly eroded over the years. Um, we don't have the time to get into all of that, uh, but what I'm going to do is discuss several of them so that it'll give you a feel for um, the thesis of, of my essay. And I'd like to begin with the constitutional principle of federalism. The Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says that the powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states or to the people. Now, in this city, it's kind of considered almost impertinent to remind senators and people who work on the White House staff that the powers of the federal government are actually limited. Uh, they're, they're limited to those that are actually spelled out into the in the Constitution. Now, for much of our history, crime fighting was understood to be an issue for local government. Uh, but over the years, Congress continues to pass more and more federal laws, as has been discussed. Um, and it's based upon a dubious reading of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. 
Now, one of the most recent proposals that has been in the news is a, is a, a ban on so-called hate crimes. They call it the Hate Crimes Prevention Act. But if you think about it for just a moment, you'll realize that this law is not going to prevent anything. Any criminal who is already inclined to shoot another person, to stab another person, another human being, the idea that this person is now going to stop it to put down the gun or put down the knife because Congress has now passed the Hate Crimes Prevention Act, I mean, this is, this is fantasy. This is not going to happen. It's not going to prevent uh, any crime, uh, any hate crime uh, from happening. But these pieces of legislation give congressmen an opportunity to posture as problem solvers. A few years ago, the Supreme Court uh, invalidated a very similar law called the Violence Against Women Act, where the Supreme Court said, no, uh, the powers of the Congress are limited, and this law passed by Congress gets the federal government into uh, an area which, in which they should not be involved. But the point here is that even after the Supreme Court invalidated the Violence Against Women Act, Congress keeps coming back with these proposals, hate crimes legislation. They keep pushing the envelope. So this constitutional principle of federalism is still in serious trouble. Now, closely related to this issue is the constitutional safeguard against double jeopardy. Double jeopardy, as you know, is the idea that no one should be tried twice for the same offense. But every time Congress federalizes something that's already on the books at the state and local level, the double jeopardy prote protection is weakened because there are some legal precedents out there that say that the federal government and the state governments are separate sovereigns. So that for allows federal prosecutors to come back with a federal indictment even after the person has been tried in the state court system. Now, in the beginning, this wasn't much of a problem because there were only a handful of federal crimes. But as the number of federal crimes uh, increases, the double jeopardy protection um, is weakened. Next is the jury trial. The Sixth Amendment to the Constitution says in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall have a right to trial by jury. Now reading this, you could easily get the misleading impression that most of our criminal cases are adjudicated by juries, but that's not the system that we have. We've moved over to a system of charge and sentence bargaining. You, you see the occasional trial on TV. We saw the O.J. Simpson trial a few years ago. Uh, the late Michael Jackson was brought up on charges in Los Angeles, so we heard about the Michael Jackson trial. The Martha Stewart trial has been mentioned. But these are the exceptional cases. More than 95% of the criminal cases in America do not go to trial. They're resolved through plea bargains. A few years ago, there was a federal judge Judge uh, Patrick Higginbotham wrote a law review article, and he, told, and he titled it, Why Do We Keep Calling Them Trial Courts? Because he's like, there aren't trials going on in the court system. Our courthouses are filled with these majestic courtrooms, but they're vacant most of the day. The real action is out in the hallways where prosecutors are negotiating with defense counsel uh, in, in plea negotiations. And plea bargaining rests upon the legal fiction that the government is not prepared to retaliate against people who want to take their case to a trial. Um, they, what they do is they say, look, if you take the deal, if you take the plea deal and plead guilty, you'll get 18 months or a year. If you insist on going to trial, then we're going to throw the book at you. Then you're going to be looking at 15 or 20 years. And with this kind of pressure, most people cave in and, and plead guilty. A federal judge in Massachusetts, somebody I think Harvey has had some dealings with, Judge William Young up in Massachusetts, he wrote in one of his rulings, he said, criminal trial rates in Massachusetts and in the country at large are plummeting due to the simple th fact that today we punish people and punish them severely simply because they want to take their case to trial. And he's absolutely right about that. Now, the Sixth Amendment also guarantees uh, our right to a speedy trial. But this is another guarantee that's being watered down. Uh, there was a case in North Carolina a few years ago where a man pointed out to the courts that he had been in jail for four years and he had not yet gotten to trial. Um, now, the speedy trial, I mean, that phrase is a little imprecise. We don't know exactly what it means. Uh, but he said, surely four years is a blatant violation of the speedy trial guarantee. But the government attorneys came back and said, not so fast. Their argument to the courts was that, look, our courthouses are clogged with cases, and we've had some staffing shortages. So because we have not, because we've been experiencing these problems and we haven't acted with any particular vindictiveness against this particular guy, the Constitution was not violated. Actually, the appellate courts agreed with that argument. 
Um, but two justices on the North Carolina Supreme Court filed a dissent. And they said that they, they went into their opinion and they went in great detail and said, look, the, the speedy trial guarantee goes all the way back to the days of Magna Carta. And they said no one in the state would probably consider a four-year delay acceptable if their spouse had been involved or if their son or daughter had been involved. If they were waiting four years to get to a trial, nobody would have considered that to be uh, acceptable. And the dissenters also raised a question to the majority on the court. They said, what happens if these uh, congestion in our courts continue? Or what happens if they get even worse? What, where are we going to be in 10 years? Are eight-year delays going to become acceptable, an acceptable norm in our jurisprudence? And the majority of the North Carolina Supreme Court did not respond to these questions. They just left it out there. Now, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says that private property shall not be taken for a public use without just compensation. And the Supreme Court has ruled that the purpose of this guarantee is to prevent state agents from forcing some people to bear public burdens which ought to be shouldered by the public at large through the general treasury. The problem here is that law enforcement has been fighting to exempt itself from this legal principle. There was a case in California a few years ago where the police had chased this robbery suspect into a convenience store and he was held up there, he didn't want to surrender, so they surrounded the place and they ended up having to use uh, tear gas to fire it in there to get this guy to surrender and he eventually did. Uh, and he was arrested and prosecuted and so forth. But the owner of the convenience store uh, came forward and he said, oh, I'm t totally innocent. Uh, I wasn't involved. Um, his store uh, incurred tremendous damage, uh, the damage from what the, the police had been doing. And he, he had like inventory losses totaling more than $200,000. So he wanted compensation for his losses, and the, and the government refused to compensate him. So he brought his claim into the courts, into the California courts, and he said, my property has been taken for a public use without just compensation. The courts rejected uh, his claim. Again, there were dissenting justices who said that this person, uh, you know, his constitutional rights had been violated, but he lost. Now, it's important to point out that the owner of the store and these justices, they didn't say that the police acted improperly. They, they used the tactics that uh, were appropriate in the circumstances. But the legal question is, who should incur the losses given that situation? Should it be the individual store owner or should it be the public at large uh, who, you know, supports the police and, and their enforcement tactics? Um, it's unjust that such losses should fall disproportionately on single individuals. Now, the Fifth Amendment also says that no one can be deprived of their liberty without due process of law. But there are very harsh theories of strict liability that have been creeping into our law. And again, boil down, uh, these theories of strict liability basically mean that the circumstances don't matter. If certain basic facts can be shown, then the person is guilty, and they basically cannot bring any defense into court to show the jury. Let me give you a quick example as to how this works. Uh, a few years ago, there was a man who was replacing carpeting in a room that he was renting. And as he was ripping up the carpet, he found a bullet under the carpet. So he took the bullet and he put it on a dish on the dresser and, and forgot about it. Months later, he got into uh, a dispute with his ex-girlfriend. Uh, she had called the police and accused him of uh, taking some of her personal possessions. And so the police had come to his door and he let the police in to show that he didn't have the stereo equipment or whatever a property that she accused him of having, so he let the police in to look around to show them he didn't have her stuff. But as the police were looking around, they did find the bullet on the dish in this, uh, in this man's bedroom. And he is now serving a 15-year mandatory minimum sentence for possessing this bullet. Because there is a federal law that says felons cannot possess ammunition. And he had had a felony record, but he was back in the community trying to reestablish himself. And, <clears throat> and this is what I mean, where he has a felony record, there's no, there's no disputing that. And he admitted to the police that the bullet, he told them the circumstances in which he had found it and why he put it on the dresser. So he's a felon, and the bullet is in his, in his bedroom. So there's really nothing he could go into court to tell the jury the circumstances in which all of this happened. Under a strict criminal theory of liability, he's guilty. And that's how harsh uh, these theories of liability are. And they have crept into our jurisprudence where people cannot, again, 
show a jury good faith or the innocent circumstances in, in which things happen. So this is another disturbing legal trend that's underway. Finally, I do want to take a moment to address the drug war. We can't have a discussion at the Cato Institute about the criminal justice system uh, without talking at least briefly uh, about drug policy. It seems to me that policymakers today are making all of the same mistakes that we made with our experience with alcohol prohibition. Alcoholism was and is a serious problem, but uh, the ban was totally counterproductive. Uh, people continued to drink, gangster organizations got rich off the black market, and all we got was a lot of crime and corruption. We kind of came to recognize that and turned away from that policy. But we're seeing the same thing these days with drug policy. Uh, drug addiction is a problem, but the drug war is counterproductive. Uh, we're spending billions of dollars every year into this war, but drugs uh, hasn't stopped drugs from coming into the country, hasn't stopped people from using drugs, hasn't kept drugs away from our schools. What we have gotten is a lot of crime, a lot of corruption, and a lot of curtailment of our civil and constitutional rights. The drug laws have created, a, I think, a cruel lottery system of arrest and uh, incarceration. Some people, like our, our own president, Barack Obama, and uh, Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer, they've kind of won the lottery, the drug law enforcement lottery, in that they've escaped arrest and they've gone on to live productive and successful lives. But thousands of others have lost the drug enforcement lottery, and they are the ones that get a criminal record, and many of them have to serve jail time, and their lives are fundamentally uh, altered. The conservative William F. Buckley and Milton Friedman were right. The sooner we end the drug war, uh, the better. Now, I'm just about out of time, so uh, let me close. I agree with those who say that America has the best criminal justice system in the world. I'm not an expert on comparative law, but if we don't have the best, it's certainly one of the best systems in the entire world. But still, we have to take a sober, clear-eyed view of the trends that are underway. We are drifting away from our basic constitutional principles. Uh, so the key question is, what is the American criminal justice system going to look like in 20 or 30 years from now? Uh, it seems to me that the principles I've been discussing of federalism, a jury trial, speedy trial, double jeopardy. These principles are important today as they were 200 years ago. Um, if you think so too, then I think it's imperative that we come to the defense of these principles because if we don't, we're going to lose them. And if we lose these uh, procedural guarantees, then we're going to lose the free society that they were designed to secure. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. We have time for, I think, several questions. I am instructed to advise you to wait until the handheld microphone is brought to you, and please to identify yourself and any affiliation you may have. Now, I want to put a qualifier on that since we are at the Cato Institute, which is the temple of individual liberty. I don't want anyone to uh, confess to any uh, affiliation that might be an admission against interest. So uh, if you feel the need, you can just give us your name if you want to. But yes, uh, questions. We'll start right there. Uh, Professor Silverglade, right? Got pronunciation right. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you were making points about uh, how these crimes are vague. And as an attorney, I've always heard this notion that if a statute is vague, it can be voided for vagueness. And why, why aren't these statutes attacked on that basis, or have they been, and have, has it just not been successful? Um, you, you, you did pronounce my name right, but you got my title wrong. I'm not a professor. I've taught at law school from time to time, but I pride myself on being a practitioner, not a theoretician. Uh, the, uh, you're correct. The statutes uh, violate due process they're, if they're vague. Um, that's the void for vagueness doctrine. And that doctrine actually enjoyed uh, support for uh, most of the life of the republic. And in fact, during the uh, war against Jim Crow segregation back in the uh, late 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, where states sought to enforce 
uh, disturbing the peace statutes against civil rights demonstrators, the Supreme Court was very clear in case after case that if the statute was unclear, you could not you could not convict somebody for violating it. They had to know what their duty was. So, uh, for example, if there was a, a statute or a regulation saying you couldn't have a demonstration near the courthouse, uh, near was a little bit vague, and that you, the law had to be clearer than that. Uh, so the, the fundamental principle uh, of clarity in the criminal law uh, has proceeded fairly healthy until about the mid-1980s, when prosecutors, the courts, and the Congress all seem to agree that as long as they understood the law, it didn't matter whether you did. And there has been a degradation in that doctrine uh, until, the, until the present. Yes, down here. Uh, Howard Woldridge with a cop, Citizens Opposing Prohibition, retired police detective. Um, I certainly agree with Mr. Lynch that the war on drugs, modern prohibition as we call it now, uh, it certainly exacerbates everything we've talked about today. Uh, but a, a question from Mr. Silverglade. In the academy, I learned that to have a crime, you needed mens re and actus reus, criminal thought, criminal intent, plus an act. Uh, is there, and of course, we've gotten away with that today with the vagueness in other situations. Uh, is it possible that a legislature could pass a law whereby a jury would be allowed to hear from the defendant that he, he lacked mens re. Is that, or is that just too overbroad? Well, first of all, um, you, you, Tim's book really takes on that issue head on. The, uh, the old common law, you, in order to be convicted of a crime, you had to have the intent to commit it, you had to knowingly commit the act. And the intent, you also had to understand that the act was a crime. So all these things had to coalesce. Uh, in fact, as, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, that those requirements have been watered down. We now have quite a few strict liability offenses, like this bullet case. Um, that's a very good, that's a scary example, actually. In the white collar arena, of course, there are many such statutes where uh, you can be guilty uh, without intending to commit a crime. You could be guilty because somebody else in the organization um, committed a crime, uh, falsified something. Corporation can be convicted. Uh, and so that that protection has indeed been watered down. Uh, it's an ancient, ancient common law protection um, that really is a hallmark of the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-American criminal justice system, and we're losing it. It can, it can, it has to make very clear in the statute. First of all, the first thing is they have to write clearer statutes because you have to be able to understand what the law requires. And mens rea should be written into every criminal statute, yes. Sometimes, the, like in the drug war context, like with medical marijuana, there have been attempts to uh, bring in a legal defense so that people can, who have been arrested and they're using drugs for medicinal purposes. See, right now under the law, sometimes they cannot get that information to a jury because federal prosecutors will say, well, look, possession of marijuana is... <clears throat> is against federal law under all circumstances. And they want to change the law to allow them to tell a jury exactly why they were possessing marijuana, to let them know about their physical condition, that they were using it for medicinal purposes, not for recreational drug use. But the, the prosecutors are very adamant in fighting these things. They do not want juries to understand, to learn about the circumstances, because then the, some of these people may be acquitted. So again, these things interact with one another. Uh, if, if your attorney tells you that you're not going to be able to get that information to a jury, are you going to be more likely to plead guilty to the offense rather than go to jury trial in the, in the first place? Of course you are, because you're not going to be able to present a defense. Tim has given an example in the marijuana area where the federal law doesn't recognize any legitimate use, but they also, and this I have a chapter in my book about this, they also harass medical practitioners who administer uh, lawful narcotics for pain uh, r relief purposes because the feds have a, their own idea as to how much narcotic is necessary to cure, an, uh, to, to cure a pain situation or to prevent pain. And if the, if, if the doctor has one idea and the drug enforcement agent has another, guess whose view prevails? It's astonishing. Let me, before we take the next question, just add one of my own thoughts to this, because this is 
taking justice out of the justice system, and, and, and it's invidious to the, to the trust the public has in, in that system of law. And I think a good example is not in the criminal, but, but in the product liability area, where strict liability was developed as a concept to solve a social problem, which was people who were harmed in industrial accidents should be compensated. Uh, and so they use the justice system, the tort system in that case, where you're supposed to find responsibility based on negligence of somebody to take money out of their pocket and said, let's forget about the negligence. He's got deep pockets. We'll just take some money out of it. He'll never miss it. And that mentality to, to steal the justice system for other purposes undermines the, the, the concept of justice, and if we lose enough of that, then we, the, the whole democratic process is endangered if people don't trust fundamentally that the justice system is trying to deliver justice. Let, let me go to the next question. There's questions uh, in the back, too. Yeah, back there. Yeah. Uh, there's a, several things that came up. Uh, the bullet, uh, the gentleman down in front, uh, uh, given two issues, the police officer or inspector, uh, jury notification. Could a jury uh, declare a person innocent uh, in this context? They can, but the system is is designed in such a way that that is very likely not to happen because, uh, first of all, 95% of the cases, as I said, are, do not go to trial in the first place. Then the next thing that happens is before the trial gets underway, the prosecutor sit down with the judge and will say, like, take the medical marijuana situation. This is a classic case where you're likely to find sympathy from the jury. Where they, even somebody who supports the drug war may think in these circumstances where a person has a medical condition, they think it's, the prosecution is totally wrong. So this is a classic case where you're likely to find sympathy with the jury. But the prosecutors, as I said, will sit down with the judge and they'll say, judge, we don't want any mention of the defendant's medical condition. We don't want any discussion of medical marijuana initiatives pending in California's referendum process. All these things are irrelevant, judge. They shouldn't come up. If you possess marijuana, uh, it's, it's a crime under federal law. So all these things should be excluded. So then you have that and then you'll have the judge's instructions when it the, just before a jury goes off to deliberate and he'll say you have to take the laws as I instruct you on it. You cannot take it uh, among yourselves to, to declare what the law is. So again once the defendant sits down with his attorney and he learns all of these facts he's much more likely not even to go to the jury in, in the first place. So these are all the factors that militate against uh, jury nullification. Actually, the gentleman right there, yeah. We'll go back there after that. Uh, Brian Walsh from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, great presentation. I have a question for you. The, um, as you both know, the Model Penal Code has mens rea provisions uh, codified into it so that it's expected that the Model Penal Code, you'll always have a mens rea, um, a default mens rea provision if none's actually put into the, um, the, the statute, the criminal offense. What do you think about, have, have you practiced under a model penal code jurisdiction? I know there's about 15 states that have adopted that, that type of system. And do you think that's a, a good idea, both you and Tim, um, to adopt something like that in the federal level? I think it's a very good idea. It works in state. I, I find now, at this point in my career, that more justice is dispensed in the state courts than the federal courts. And uh, that wasn't true when I started uh, back in the late 60s. The, um, uh, the problem with mens rea is that it is vastly watered down now in federal law. And uh, it, even, as Tim pointed out, with the proliferation of absolute liability offenses, it's really gone. Uh, if, if the Congress doesn't want to put a mens rea uh, provision in a federal statute, it doesn't have to. I wish the Supreme Court would uh, get a little bit more guts on this question and bring us back to where we were a couple centuries ago. Yeah, I totally agree. We have to move towards that type of system where the statutes are ambiguous on mens rea. There should be a default provision, as in the model penal code. And then we, the legislature should sh straight up abolish strict liability and vicarious liabilities. These theories of criminal liability have no place in America. All the way at the back. Thank you. Hi, uh, Adam Curland. I'm a law professor at Howard University. This is to Mr. Lynch. I mean, generally, I'm, in, I'm sympathetic with both of your guys' um, comments, but normally, I, I haven't been to one of these things in a while, normally it's more balanced, though. I mean, where's the, where's the prosecutor? Because some of the points you make, there are some obvious responses that I think would put the debate in, um, 
in at least a more fair perspective. The first is the California situation, the medical marijuana, um, is really a political issue. And my understanding is the Justice Department isn't prosecuting um, many of the medical marijuana cases there. But the issue that, Tim, that you were talking about having to do with um, uh, the evidence and stuff like that, that's because the law says that it's irrelevant, and it isn't just the prosecutor negotiating, and you know this with, with, with the judge, the law says it's irrelevant, and it's really a policy issue as to whether or not the powers that be in the federal government are going, are going to change that. But the tension between how it deals with the state issues and the federal issues remain, and, and, and that itself becomes a political issue. The other point, again, there's, I mean, every comment, there's a retort to it, but the other one is somebody made a comment concerning the common law principles that uh, common laws required a mens rea and actus reus, and that you had to know that the conduct was criminal. That's simply false. I mean, knowledge that the conduct is criminal is different from strict liability, and that's not necessarily um, the way it was with respect to all statutes. So some of these points require um, at least a more fuller balance, and that would actually strengthen, I think, your guys' case, because it wouldn't be just this punching bag that, that, that can't respond. So Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, on the first point about normally we do have events all the time. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes we invite a co contrary point of view. For this particular event, sometimes we don't. I thought it was kind of a uh, kind of a burden to ask somebody to read two books on short notice to be able to 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 comment. But you know, we, that's why we have the Q and A periods. I'm glad you came, and I'm glad uh, you know you raised the contrary. Uh, point of view with these things. We are bouncing around to a couple of different legal concepts. You're right. <clears throat> well, I mean, when the point came up about criminal intent and good faith, that's the circumstance in which I raised the medical marijuana issue. You're right that, <clears throat> and I thought we made that point, that under the law right now, the good faith and intent is not an issue under federal law. It's very strict. If you possess marijuana, you're guilty of the offense. But because we were talking about intent and good faith, our point is that this is a problem in the law because most juries who, who uh, you know, they learn about these things later, the circumstances of the case, that the person had a medical condition, and that's the only reason that they had marijuana. They feel very angry and they feel used and abused by the system because some of this information is kept from them. So our point is that we want to allow defendants to be able to bring the circumstances of their individual cases into court and present them to juries. Then the prosecutors always have the opportunity to come back and say either that was a lie or that's not so, and they can present their point of view, but to totally exclude people like their medical condition and those sorts of things from the case totally, we think that that's wrong and that's why we think the law should be changed uh, to allow them to do so. And I'll say this, in my book, uh, in his forward, Alan Dershowitz does uh, make one criticism of my thesis. Uh, uh, he says that, well, uh, prosecutors can't be blamed for for creative interpretation of statutes and creatively using statutes uh, to as, as a basis for prosecuting new activity that was not contemplated when the statute was 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 enacted because it takes creative prosecution in order to meet the creative criminals that criminals figure out new ways to do things and prosecutors have to twist the law in order to cover these new ways. Well, I think that that's, uh, that's wrong. If there is a new f formulation of you know, how to commit a crime, it's up to the legislature to pass a statute that covers it. And it's not a defense to this vague, the use of vague statutes to say, well, Congress is 85 years behind in its understanding of society. I don't buy that. It may be true, but it's not acceptable. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. I'm Bill Klein, just from Washington, D.C. A question relating particularly to your lottery point you made a while ago, but also anything else that's relevant. I'm curious to know where the increasing impending total loss of privacy fits into all this. We don't have electronic privacy or walking down the street privacy or financial privacy or medical privacy, all the rest. Where does that fit into all these things as far as potentially getting hooked up in the criminal system? Well, 
<clears throat> it's interesting because uh, last night I was with Mark Rotenberg, who heads the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and they're busier than ever. They've taken on new people uh, because the violations of privacy are cascading. Uh, that has an indirect relationship to what Tim and I are talking about because what's happening is since the government now knows everything we're all doing, the potential for them bringing prosecutions both in the category that Tim's written about and the category that I've written about are vastly multiplied. And so when I say, you know, everyone commits three felonies a day, the problem is that the feds know about two of them. Yes. And tomorrow they might know about three. Hugh McElrath, Department of Energy. Um, I want to tell you another example that maybe is in your book. I haven't read it um, and ask you to comment. I'm told that the um, identity theft laws, and if I'm not mistaken, there is part of that's incorporated in the Patriot Act, are actually being used in the majority of cases to prosecute illegal immigrants who have fake uh, social security cards. So they're not attempting to steal anybody's identity. If anything, they're contributing to that person's social security account without any prospect of getting uh, a benefit. Yes, my, my understanding, uh, tell me if this is the same uh, case you're, you're thinking of, is that people are uh, forging social security cards and putting made up numbers on them. They're not stealing, you know, your social security number or mine. They are making them you know, out of whole cloth, right? So this is a, a, a phony social security card and they are being prosecuted for what's essentially identity theft, for trying to make themselves appear to be somebody that they're not. Whereas it actually the law meant to protect you from having your identity stolen, they're being prosecuted under a law simply not directed to that the activity they're engaged in, the, the illegal immigrants trying to stay in this country. That is, I think, a prime example of what I'm talking about, yes. And one of the things you, I think you talk about in your book is the creative efforts by, by prosecutors. And, 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 of course, I think of the RICO statute, which was created for one purpose and has been cleverly used in other contexts, perhaps not as intended when the statute was written. Right, well, it was meant for organized crime, and it was ended up being used for anti-abortion protesters. It's quite remarkable. Right down here. John Swallow, Arlington, Virginia. And uh, I uh, won't mention the group I'm involved with, but we're... we're uh, uh, I, I will uh, quote another author who says, men in divorce are the most discriminated against minority in society. I would say among adults because the kids get abused in the divorce proceedings as well. And I'm wondering if you guys uh, have any comment on, uh, you know, the unconstitutionality of, of uh, family courts. And in, in Virginia, 90% of the, of the uh, divorces end up, uh, give, give sole custody one, to one parent with the gender of the parent being by far the most important factor, irregardless of the quality of the parenting of either either parent. And then, uh, while they're all civil agreements most of the time, uh, violations can be criminal. I've, I, I know of a guy whose wife has accused him of, uh, of uh, spying for Russia and India. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know much. Yeah, um, I, I have to say that I've... Uh, I've never done a divorce case in my entire career. My clients, no, I'm a criminal lawyer, and my clients have figured out different ways of getting rid of their spouses rather than. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Why don't we go back there on audience right? Thank you, Eric Sterling. I used to be counsel to the House Judiciary Committee and helped write the Money Laundering Control Act of 1986. And this was a case where uh, the Congress w wanted to punish the crime of money laundering, but the conduct of making deposits, of withdrawing funds, of opening accounts, of course, is perfectly lawful conduct engaged in by law-abiding citizens all the time. But the challenge was how to properly define the states of mind and the criminal circumstances that would make that lawful conduct a crime. And you found yourself in a situation where, um, you know, as I was saying, we have to write this precisely. 
I had this, this sense that members of Congress saw my forehead glowing with the letters ACLU because I was, you know, trying to insist that this be written so that uh, due process applied. But this was at a time in which when the head of the DEA field office in D.C. was asked why he liked drug enforcement, could reply to the Washington Post reporter and not get a rise out of her. Well, what he liked about it was government gets to control the commission of the crime. Thank you. I can respond to the, uh, the gentleman's point this way. One of the cases I've written about in my book is the Boston prosecution, uh, United States versus Theodore Anzalone. He was an aide to then Boston Mayor Kevin White. They were trying to get him for something, anything, in order to turn him as a witness against the, um, the mayor. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of the charges that they brought was a money laundering charge based on the <clears throat> the cash uh, anti-structuring uh, regulations that you're talking about. And uh, <clears throat> we went through, the, uh, he was uh, convicted in the district court. The First Circuit reversed, and the government uh, very aggravated that it couldn't bring prosecution based upon the regulations, simply went back and got Congress to change the statute. And the, they then made the activity that Anzalone had engaged in a crime. Now, I think that the amount of regulation in, in this arena is way overblown. That's, that's my own philosophical, right? But at least now you're on notice that doing what my client, Teddy Anzalone, had done is a crime. When he went through his, uh, the agony of his trial, uh, the statute didn't outlaw it, and yet he went through a trial. He was convicted because the district judge didn't understand the law. The prosecutor maybe understood it, but wanted to try to get away with it anyway. And um, finally, the First Circuit put an end to it. The First Circuit has m much degenerated since then with respect to its respect for the principles of clarity. Uh, but back then, it was like the, the, the early 80s. It, was the, the, uh, not, it wasn't exactly a golden age, but there was a, a better, better age than today. Uh, thank you. Th that concludes uh, our, our forum. I understand there's a luncheon. <laughs> There is a luncheon upstairs in the Winter Garden where conversations may continue. <laughs>